Thanks. Recording. Okay, thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so hi. So, I imagine that most of you, just like me, have spent some time meditating in one form or another. And if so, you've probably been told at some point to just observe whatever is arising. And you've probably done just that. Maybe <laughs> it's hunger. <laughs> Your legs are aching. Or perhaps you're feeling some arousal. But you've probably noticed that whoever is doing that observing has their own views on what's going on. Mm -hmm. Such as, how much longer do I need to sit here? <laughs> or, I'm a lousy meditator. Or perhaps, wait a minute, just be with what is. So this presentation is about the interplay between these two sets of voices in your head. It asks, who is the observer? Who or what is being observed? What is the relationship between them? And why does it all matter? And we're going to look at these questions from some different perspectives. I'll be sharing with you a little bit of my own experience we'll be taking a look at the biological evolution of the I and the self and how that can inform our spiritual understanding. And I'll be offering a viewpoint on how we can learn to live with our split consciousness in love and harmony. For me, this has been the result of a 10-year journey from when I was the CEO of a high-flying public internet company through a spiritual path of meditation, yoga, and qigong infused with Buddhism and Taoism, paralleled with a conceptual journey through evolutionary psychology, human history, cognitive science, and neuroscience. And it's a journey that has taken me to a place of love and harmony, which is part of what I want to share today. So we'll begin with the evolutionary journey of life going back billions of years ago to when the world was populated with just single-celled organisms like this bacterium. The amazing thing is that even this bacterium has a sense of self. It can sense the environment. So if you put a little sugar in the water where that bacterium is swimming, it immediately turns around and swims towards mm -hmm. that sugar. That bacterium knows what it likes. And studying that bacterium can help us to understand what are the truly essential elements of a self. A self needs a membrane that separates the internal from the external. It's aware of the environment. It absorbs energy and matter and organizes it for nutrition. A self is composed of self-organized processes that arise spontaneously. It makes value judgments. It demonstrates intentionality. It chooses what to do. And every single living organism that's evolved on this earth in the last four billion years has had a sense of self. From a starfish, to a slug, to a frog, a tree, a tiger, and a chimpanzee. They all have a sense of self. And as soon as she's born, a human has a sense of self too. But a human has something that no other mammal has. A part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex that's more developed in humans than any other animal. It's the prefrontal cortex, or PFC, that mediates those parts of our cognition that are uniquely human, such as symbolic thought, conceptualizing planning, and creating abstractions. It's also what controls our physiological drives and imposes meaning on things. And there's something else that the PFC enables us to do, which we'll look into right now. Here's a little girl in the grass wondering if I tell her my secret, what will she think of me? She's aware that the other girl has a separate mind, just like she does. That's a crucial human attribute mediated by the PFC that cognitive scientists call 
theory of mind. And meanwhile, that other little girl is looking back at her thinking, I should be taking better care of my little sister. She's applied that same faculty to her own identity and recognized that she has a self with a story attached to it, just like her sister. It's this faculty that led humans to evolve a separate I and self within our consciousness. Think of our sense of self arising from a swirling array of massively networked synaptic connections, like this picture, only a hundred million times more complex. These are known as attractors, because while they swirl around dynamically, they remain attracted to a stable set of patterns. Now imagine these attractors bifurcating. So they now swirl around two different centers, intimately connected, but also separate. This is how the I forms separately from the self. As the leading neuroscientist Gerald Edelman puts it, it's only with a flowering of higher order consciousness and linguistic capabilities made possible by the PFC that a self arises that is nameable to itself. And that's what is required for advanced forms of self-consciousness and consciousness of consciousness. Jeremy, sorry, I, I think I zoned out for a split second. What did you say those green things are? So those are, think of those as attractors, like massively networked synaptic connections, like in our, in our brain, in our mind, mm -hmm. but like a million, a hundred million times more complex than that. And so one set of attractors, one set like forms their sense of self. But what we as humans do is these attractors bifurcate. So we've got two different sets of swirling neurons flowing uh, around, mm -hmm. uh, like networks of neurons flowing around us. That create that is stable in two different places, completely attracted, mm -hmm. totally part of the same thing, but also with two different centers. So this is just a conceptual metaphor. This is not supposed to be some neurophysiological yes. illustration of something. Right. Like that. Right. When you say yeah. attractors, you mean attracted to itself? Well, like, they're like called that? attractors because they're they're stable. Um, and yet they're swirling all the time, but they're attracted to a stable set of patterns, which is why they're known as attractors. And that's that's like a um, something coming from complexity theory. It's also to do with neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So it's like a metaphor, but it's also actually based on the actual way in which identity yeah, is created so in, okay. in consciousness. I, uh, <coughs> let's come back to that. I don't want to interrupt your presentation, but I think sure. this, you could do more with this to yeah. cap some fun. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's come back to that at the end. Thanks. So, um, so that's what's required for advanced forms of self-consciousness and consciousness of consciousness. So we can think of the I as the emergent aggregation of all the narratives I tell myself, such as I am a teacher, or I am wondering what they think about me, or I am a mother, I am hoping to succeed in my life. I am a wife. I am going to get old and die someday. And that is the beginning of the, re the relationship between the I and myself. So, In the words of the brilliant cognitive linguist George Lakoff, mm -hmm. we conceptualize ourselves into two distinct entities that can be at war, locked in a struggle for control. It's something rooted deep in our unconscious conceptual systems, so much so that it takes considerable effort and insight to see how it functions. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to work on right now. Lakoff points out that this split is so embedded in all of us that we readily talk about ourselves as if we're two different people without even thinking about it. Consider these sentences. I let myself go in the dance. Or perhaps I found myself in dancing. We often talk about the I and the self in a struggle with each other. I need to pull myself together. I torture myself. I'm disappointed in myself. But I can also get along well with myself. I can feel proud of myself, at peace with myself. I can love myself and even be at one with myself. So let's look a little deeper into how this all works. Well, I continually receive inputs from myself, 
such as sensations, emotions, feelings, drives, instincts, and thoughts. And then I'm continually responding to myself with narratives, goals, and intentions, values, judgments, behaviors, and inhibitions. But I'm also powerfully affected by other forces from outside myself, something we might call an ego, which I tend to think of as an acronym for externally generated order. These external forces affect my narrative of who I should be and can take the form of religious values, social values, parental values, economic values, and cultural values. Together, these have the effect of driving the eye further and further away from the self. So the relationship between I and myself gets to be more distant and tenuous, leading to the states we all know so well where I'm disappointed in myself, I'm hard on myself, and I set unrealistic expectations for myself. In fact, we can think of that Buddhist term dukkha, or suffering, as a measure of the distance between the I and the self. So it turns out that managing the relationship between I and myself is the key to harmonious living. Taking inputs from the self with curiosity, trust, and acceptance, and giving back to the self kindness, intention, and love. But wait a minute. When we start talking about managing the relationship between the I and the self, who is it that's doing the managing? I've spent a long time exploring this question, and I can share with you my own personal insights. I came to realize that within me, and potentially within every one of us, is another attractor of consciousness, one that I have come to call the wise one who always watches. And for me, this is roughly what that wise one looks like. The wise one who always watches can influence the tone and the essence of the relationship between I and myself. And he goes by different names in different spiritual traditions. You can think of him as Buddha nature, as the guru within, as the Taoist sage, and maybe as the soul. For me, that wise one helped me on a path towards love for myself that I'm going to share with you now. It's a path that begins with recognizing the gap between I and myself and deciding to reduce that gap, which I can do either by changing the expectations I hold for myself or changing myself to match my expectations. Deciding which it should be requires some careful discernment. How many of my expectations for myself are created by values of the ego that aren't necessarily beneficial for me as an integrated organism? I need to carefully process these values along with what I receive from myself and out of these develop intention. It's setting intention that is really the beginning of a spiritual path. And it's very important at this stage to recognize the difference between setting intention and setting goals for yourself. When I have a goal orientation, I will inevitably maintain the distance between I and myself. I'll keep asking, am I there yet? Why not? Why don't I make more progress? I can't wait until I'm no longer whatever it is in your case. Here are some examples of what I mean by goals. To find a loving relationship, to overcome my inner conflicts, to achieve enlightenment. All admirable goals, but all focused on a destination. Now here are some examples of what I mean by intentions. To be more in touch with my body, to calm down my inner conflict, to feel more at peace with myself. These establish a sense of direction. 
When you have goals with a destination, it causes you to focus on what you want to be, to reject what you already are, and to pay attention to your future target. It takes you on a journey of ambition. When you have intentions with a sense of direction, it causes you to nurture what is already in you, to embrace what you love in yourself, and to be present with where you are now. That leads you on a journey of discovery. So intention is a journey without a destination. And with intention, I can treat myself with kindness. With intention, I can trust the path that I am on. With intention, I am able to enjoy the view my journey offers me and recognize myself as the very best it can possibly be at each moment in time. Remember before that I had the choice between changing the expectations I hold for myself um, or changing myself to match my expectations? Well, on my journey of intention, a new alternative arises to recognize that deep down I already am the person I really want to be, so that I, and the wise one who watches, can truly become one with myself. A journey that begins with intention can continue with kindness and sustain with trust, so that ultimately you can fill with love. Now sometimes you'll hear people tell you that you should spend less time on yourself and more time learning to love others. But here's what's so amazing. Loving yourself is what allows you to love all beings. That statement is not just true spiritually, it's also true in terms of neuroscience. Because when you love yourself, your body increases production of dopamine and oxytocin. This hormonal wash influences your response to others so that instead of responding with irritation and anger, your mind-body naturally responds with compassion and kindness. In this diagram, that purple represents the flow of dopamine from its production deep within the brainstem all the way to flooding the prefrontal cortex with love. That's why, when you learn to love yourself, that love becomes available to all beings. And when you love yourself unconditionally, that love just overflows to all other beings. But as we all know, life is not one fixed state of affairs. There are times when you are one with yourself and times when you are not. And perhaps what non-dual awareness is really about is being present with all the flows that arise from moment to moment between each of these different states of consciousness. So we can think of life as a continuous dance between the I and the self, set to the music of the world. As long as you are alive, the dance will always go on. It's your choice to conduct the dance with rigidity and harshness, or with kindness and joy. And for anyone interested in writing a book incorporating some of these themes called Leology towards an integration of science and meaning. You can check out my work at jeremyland.com or email me for more information. Thank you. Bravo, Jeremy.